No, okay. Okay, so the obstacle problem physically, we think we have a membrane that is attached to a wire and uh, a table, an obstacle down, and we think that the membrane is bending down due to gravity and at some point hits the, the table, the obstacle, and it creates a patch here. And we think that, uh, well, at some point the membrane rests on the, on the obstacle, on the table, and at some point it uh, should satisfy some equation. So physically, the way, uh, I mean, uh, the, the model to, uh, the mathematical model, the simplest would be to say that you want to minimize surface uh, tension, but if you want to linearize, you basically say that you want a function that here satisfy Laplace of u being equal to 1, so here the, the membrane is supposed to bend like this, and here u is supposed to be equal to 0. u is the height of the membrane away from, from the plate. And also uh, a condition would be that the, the, you, you have no angle on the, on the set, the coincidence set. So at the same time, you'd like to say that the gradient of u is equal to 0. Uh, when you separate away from 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 u equal to zero, so, uh, so let me write here mathematically. Basically, want to say that we look for Laplace of u equal to the characteristic function of the set where u is positive, and u is prescribed on the boundary of the domain omega. Yeah, omega is the is the domain here. And uh, the set where the, the, the boundary of the set where u is positive, this is the free boundary that we denoted by gamma. Gamma is known as the free boundary. And on gamma, we have two conditions, right? So on gamma, we have both that u is 0 and the gradient of u has to be 0. So it has to be a special, a special surface. OK. Um, now, what is known about the obstacle problem? So let me write. Uh, so now, I'll, I'll start the. Uh, excuse yes. me. Do you formulate this purely variationally too, or not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So variationally, this would be to one. One would have to minimize the Dirichlet energy, like this plus uh, u u plus. Let's say, but u okay. Where omega u is phi on the bound. Yeah, so this would be the variational uh, formulation of the problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so let's see, what are the known results for the obstacle problem? Known results. So it's not too difficult. First, I'll, I'll say something about the, fu the, the function u itself. So let's say u is in fact of class c11 locally so this almost follows from the equation here you have the laplace of u is bounded so almost c11 but it's not too difficult using maximum principle to show that when you sit on the zero level set you can put sort of a parabola at each point by above somehow you think that your function the way it detaches from the obstacle can only detach quadratically, uh, at, least, at least not faster than quadratically. Yeah, so this is the optimal regularity. Now, uh, the after, after you find the, the optimal regularity of solution, one is, of course, interested in understanding what would be the regularity of gamma. Yeah, so from now on, I'll just say things about the regularity of the free boundary. gamma and this follows m more or less the program like in the case of minimal surfaces so what one wants to do is to fix a point on the free boundary and start performing a blow up procedure you want to blow up you want to look closer and closer at a point on the free boundary and understand global solutions so for this you have to look at the scaling of the equation so the natural scaling of, of the equation is quadratic so let's say if you look at u r of x 
being one over r squared u of uh, x0 plus rx so let's think that this point is x0 on the free boundary yeah? and then we just uh, do a quadratic blow up around x0 the equation remains invariant also maybe one observation is that not only that you have optimal regularity here but you can also show some sort of uh, non-degeneracy in the sense that if I look in a ball of radius r around x0 and around the free boundary point and look at value of u this has to grow at least quadratic I mean this has to grow quadratically in respect to c r squared for some c small Yeah, so, so not only that I have a parabola by above, but in some direction I have to grow quadratically. Yeah? The reason for this is somehow that this is scale invariant, the statement, so it's very easy to understand. If you think you are in a ball of radius 1 and the values of you are very, very low, are very close to 0, when you look at the obstacle problem, the membrane would just go to zero very fast and would create a big patch in the middle yeah. but then the, the point in the, in the the center of the ball cannot be a free boundary point yeah. so somehow it says that not all the values have to be very small in the on the ball of radius one you need to have some some bigger values which translates into this statement after rescaling yeah. So why is this important? This is important because it says that uh, when I pr perform a quadratic blow up, sort of my function cannot disappear. It, it cannot become identically zero. The fact that I have a parabola by above also cannot become infinite. So this means that you are, so let's say consequence, consequences that you are has to converge to some let's say to some global solution so let's say u global global solution to the obstacle problem and this convergence is on subsequences so let's say not from time to time it just blow up so you can extract the subsequence let's say converges on subsequences And also the convergence is locally is uniform. Uh, it's very nice locally. Yeah. So so let's say also let's say that it is uniform locally. Okay. So then of course you just like in the case of minimal surfaces, you want to look at the global solutions. This would be common if you want. Well, n yeah. So uh, let's say I'll go here. I say this is uh, what uh, so Caffarelli in uh, '77 he uh, he did all this analysis of blow-up solutions and he proved that this capital U has to be either so there are two options for capital U uh, global cones are either uh, up to rotation let's say one half x one plus squared which means that your global solution would, would be zero and half a plane and then quadratic on the other one up to, up to rotation it looks like this so quadratic here right this is the x1 variable so either or capital u is a full quadratic polynomial not only like this but it would be one half x transpose a x with a um, a non-negative symmetric matrix let's say trace of a being equal to one so I, I would draw here if I'm in 2d would be let's say x1 one half x1 squared all along right so you can try to think that you have full parabola in which then the coincident you being zero would happen along a line if, if you think you are in, in 2d okay so this i mean this is something that um, in fact does not happen in uh, in the obstacle problem that you are able to classify absolutely all blow-ups and probably in most problems 
uh, it's difficult to classify all blobs. Here, it turns out that due to con convexity <laughs> arguments, you can actually say that these are all possible blobs for, for this problem. So the first, uh, we could, yeah. We could also just touch on one point here, right? Yeah, so, so it would still be like this, right? So, so yeah, now, okay. yes. But I mean, like, in, 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 in 2D, that would be like the features. That's also like the yes, yeah, so, so exactly. So in, three, in 2D it would be this or this. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. So you really can yeah. have. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, so somehow the second, uh, well, this is basically the purpose of, uh, of my talk, sort of to, to distinguish between uh, what sort of, uh, uh, yeah, what sort of matrices you can have here and what you can say about the, the boundary, the free boundary around points that have this, this blob profile. But essentially, if you go back to the original picture, the way I draw it here, essentially, if you expect that this is, if, if you look, let, let's look above at this picture. So if you look at the free boundary, right, like this, if you think that this is where u is equal to zero and x zero is somewhere here, essentially after blow up, I really expect to end up with this, uh, in this situation. So, also, what might happen, let's say, can I have actually, so, so let, let, me, let me write here, well, let me, let me write what Caffarelli wrote, right? So, so, so what, what, what he did, so Caffarelli, so let, me write, let me write it like some sort of theorem, saying that if I end up, if capital U ends up to be a half quadratic, something like this, then the original point x0 is regular, so let's say gamma, is an analytic surface gamma is an analytic surface near x0 and the second one if capital U ends up like what I said x transport x then what you can say you can say that gamma is cusp like Let's say gamma is cusp like around x0. So the, the picture here should be that uh, this is your zero set and this is your positive set in the first and this is x0. In the second, in the second uh, setting, the picture should be that your zero set maybe looks like this and this is x0. So a uh, cusp-like, meaning that if I look at gamma intersect a ball of radius r around x0, this can be trapped, if I look at the, the, at the free boundary in, in the ball, so this can be trapped in a slab, let's write here x1 less than or equal than R sigma of R with sigma of R tending to zero as R tends to zero. Yeah, so the picture is that in the ball of radius R, essentially the free boundary can be trapped between two parallel planes, but this, sorry, let's write here, X maybe is not good to write X1, sorry, let me write here X dot nu sub R. So it can be trapped between two parallel planes, but as you zoom in these parallel planes, they get closer and closer to each other relative to the radius, right? Sig sigma of r is the ratio between the, the height of the strip and r, but they can rotate as you zoom in. Yeah, so it looks that is is differentiable, but uh, not, not quite, almost differentiable. And, sorry to bother you, but it could also look like uh, double cut. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, I can also have it from this other side, yeah. yes. So I, I don't know exactly what happens in yeah, this yeah. slab. I mean, so, it so it yes, yes, it's absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it could look in some sense complicated. I, I drew it very nice, uh -huh. but in, in principle, it could look very complicated as, as you zoom in, yes. So these are the results of Caffarelli from uh, 77. 
I mean, cusp like, uh, do, do you have such points in general? So you can try to think that, well, in general, maybe not, but you can try to think of a situation here. If you start playing with a boundary data, if you think that you take this wire and you, <laughs> you bend it in more and more and more, so let's, let's think that you bend it in more and more and more, then what would happen to the coincidence set? Somehow the coincidence set would shrink, but here the, the membrane would lift up and here would shrink again, something like this, yeah? So you can try to think the fact that the wires come closer and closer to each other, the membrane, instead of going all the way to zero between the points that are close, would just bend just a little bit inside here. So if you try to think that this is like a continuous, uh, you're, doing the, you're, you're changing the data continuous, I'm changing also the domain, not only the data, right? So I'm changing the domain at the same time, but basically the, the coincidence set would look eventually from here, would end up with two patches like this. So somewhere in between, I would have to have some sort of singular uh, point here. So maybe they are not very generic, at least in this picture, but for sure they are there. Um, and here, of course, when I blow up at such a point, let's see this picture. When I blow up at such a point, I expect to get uh, quadratic, which vanishes along, uh, along the patch. Okay. So uh, anyway, if you end up with, in the first situation, you call this a regular point. <laughs> Let's say, so this, this is just a definition. So gamma can be split into two sets, gamma regular, union gamma singular. These are the points where some quadratic blow up would, would end up like this, right? This corresponds to situation to case one. Well, let's say case one over there, right? <coughs> one or two. So this corresponds to one if the blow up is like in one, and this would correspond to blow up and blow up just like two. Okay. Um, so let me just now mention results about the singular part of the of the free boundary. So the regular part is very nice. Now let's try to focus more on these points and what happens, I mean, Caffarelli did not prove that the blow up is unique. So this is uh, important, like in the case of minimal surfaces, you'd like to say that uh, the blow up is independent of the, of the sequence that you're, you're, that you're picking up. That would correspond basically to saying that your thing is differentiable. In other words, if, if the limit is the same and depend, independent of the sequence, it means that actually the, the way your, your approximating polynomial vanishes is the same at all scales. So basically you have no rotation in this picture. Yeah? So, so uniqueness of the blow up sequence would, corresponds to, would correspond to a better uh, information on, of, of uh, the singular part. Okay, so some results right here. Oh, maybe. So are there examples of the singular sequence that are nasty or what? Well, I guess, uh, well, so, so, so the singular set basically, one, one can try to build uh, examples like this of, of things that can uh, look maybe a bit ca counter like little uh, little patches of zeros but yeah I mean what 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 I'm going to say next is somehow that this point somehow still cannot be very well they have to lie on some nice surfaces on some 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 nice curves at least in 2d yes but it can't have the rotation of the no no it cannot have the rotation so 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 the rotation of the cusp, ca cusp cannot happen yes so so this is uh, exactly so let me say results, so I'm going to write regularity results. For gamma singular. So uh, the first result is uh, also due to Caffarelli. That is 20 years later after, after the regular, uh, after the regular part. And he used the Alt Caffarelli, Alt Caffarelli Friedman monotonicity formula. Uh, 
and you prove that the blow up is unique, the blow up sequence is unique. So, so you prove uniqueness of blow ups. So let's say prove uh, uniqueness of blow ups. And now, according to the vanishing order of this polynomial, you have different so called stra strata. So, what, what it says basically that gamma singular can be written as uh, sigma 0 union sigma 1 union, union sigma n minus 1. So, it can, can be split into n, n different sets where sigma k sigma k is a uh, k dimensional is included sigma k included in a k dimensional c1 manifold manifold and basically sigma k are the collection of all the points where the blow up when, when we look at the blow up uh, sequence the the dimension where this quadratic polynomial f vanishes is of dimension k so i expect somehow the, to have no singular points in, in the remaining direction so so the only singular points can happen sort of in the k dimensional direction and they can align but, but they can have holes so somehow the picture that i drew here can try to think of a similar picture. So the singular points it can happen, but at least they have to be part of a nice C1 curve in 2D. Yeah, so you can try to think, you can have some, this is the zero set, yeah, so something like this. And they might accumulate, yeah, they might have some accumulation points and so on. Sorry, yes. Yes, yeah, so you can really build Cantor like. Uh, you might have to maybe, I don't know, if you really want to do Cantor like. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I mean, it might be that, uh, yeah, maybe not with one right hand side. You might have to, to make it see infinity or something like this. But if you want really one right hand side, you might run out of some unique continuation. I'm not sure about one right hand side, but yeah, if you play a bit, if you're allowed to change the right hand side and make it just see infinity, yeah, you can build counter like uh, uh, pools of zeros. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's, uh, I, I will have to check. So this is an example of Sheffer, but I, 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 I would have to check if it's really with constant right hand side or if you. Oh. Yes, yes. So I mean, yeah, if, if you really look for the Laplace of u being the characteristic function of u being positive here, or if you put an f of x, yeah, f of x. No, 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 no. It's just C1, right? So, so what you can say. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit. Yes, yeah, so, so we're, we're running a bit ahead of, uh, yeah. But, but essentially, yeah, it says that uniqueness to just give you a C1 curve in 2D. So basically, the singular points have to be on a C1 curve in 2D. Yeah. Okay, so then, yeah, so, so let's see what can we say about this curve? Is, is it smoother or not? So, so the next. Now I'm going to mention a few more results. Let me go. So a few more results are, um, so I think in 99 advice, he proved that in two dimension, when n equals to two, this curves and in, in two dimension you have sigma zero consists of isolated points. So these are really points where the full u would look like this, and nearby there are no more, uh, no no other singular points. So locally u would look like this, 
sigma 1 would correspond so for the blow up sequence would look like this you say if a bunch of this can accumulate to something like that yeah. uh, let's see um, yes yeah I mean in some sense uh, th yeah this is possible yeah that, that some sigma zero but, but this doesn't say so let, let's see let's see sigma zero is yes so so a bunch of sigma zero can accumulate to something in sigma one yes that's possible yeah you can have sort of things like this that uh, become sort of closer and clo like like some sort of bunch of of uh, parabolas that okay well uh, well I, I I think yeah the way you construct these examples I think you have to play a bit to the right hand side I mean if you just put a one it's a bit rigid so I, I don't okay. think it's uh, yeah so so I think you have to play a bit to the right hand side but if you if you are allowed to do that then I, I don't think it's difficult to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's say so uh, Vice in two dimension he proved actually that sigma one is included in a C one alpha curve for some alpha positive. So he improved basically from the regularity of just being a C one curve to being C one alpha. And for this, he introduced the monotonicity formula, known in Weiss monotonicity formula, which, so let's say Weiss monotonicity formula for this problem, which essentially says that if you take the energy, it should be this, and then you have to subtract the precise constant, uh, let's see, so you have to scale it to the scale invariant when you do quadratic so this would be one over r squared let's write one over r two sorry r to the n plus two minus one over r to the n plus three b b over the boundary of br of u squared d sigma so this this quantity w of r turns out to be increasing with r and moreover uh, when you blow up at the origin it says that w will be constant and w is constant if and only if so let me write here w constant is equivalent to say that u is homogeneous of degree of degree two So Weiss used the, the monotonicity formula plus uh, an epiperimetric in it. So let's say plus epiperimetric inequality to improve on the regularity of the of the curve in 2D. And then some other results on the well, okay, so epiperimetric inequality, so it's something that comes from minimal surfaces. So you, you're basically, you, you basically want, okay. Uh, so, so, like, the, the <laughs> vice modest formula would tell you that W prime has a sign, that W of R is um, monotone, W of R is increasing as R is increasing. But you'd like to say that the limit is unique, that the um, blow up limit is unique, and uh, just the fact that it's monotone does not give you that it's unique. So you have to understand a little bit how things rotate from scale to scale and quantify it in the differential inequality for w so basically instead of just saying that the derivative of w of r has a sign just is non-negative you'd like to put the right hand side here it would allow you to say that the limit the w of r the, the, the blow up limit the ur converges to 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 a unique limit so so I, I don't want to go into details but essentially it's a way of improving the monotonicity formula 
to be able to prove convergence of the of the blow up C. Uh, it, it's a it's something that comes from the theory of minimal surfaces. Um, okay, so now there is another proof of mono. in 2003 in which he reproved this result of Caffarelli but using a different monotonicity formula. So this is the Monod proved that, uh, let's say, uh, let's say ha had a different proof but using a, a, a different proof of this fact with that sigma k is included in C1 submanifold using a monotonicity formula now is called mono monotonicity formula, which essentially says that if you look at the average, if you look at how u minus a quadratic polynomial, if you look at the average of a, a ball of radius r around the origin and you scale quadratically, this has to be monotone increasing again monotone increasing in r which essentially says that if you are very close to a quadratic polynomial at a certain scale you cannot you cannot be farther from from the same quadratic polynomial at all other smaller scale right so so the, all the monotonicity formulas they tell you that if you know something at scale one then you can conclude something at all infinitesimal scale just just because of the monotonicity Okay, and then there are like uh, recently uh, two more results. So in 2017, Colombo, uh, Spolaor, and Belichkov. No, because basically the, the the things have to be quadratic, uh, they have to be homogeneous of degree to the blow up limits. So you're saying here if I take. You mean maybe you have to add something else to this speed, but the first order should be quadratic, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you expect. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. It is not. It, I, I don't think uh, you would get uh, right. So I mean, this polynomial p here is fixed. Whatever polynomial p you give me, you give me, whatever solution u you give me with, well, here here the origin has to be singular. So let's say zero is a singular point. I look at a singular point and I give me any quadratic polynomial p with Laplace of p. Well, so this is, this is supposed to be a solution. Laplace of p has to be equal to 1 and p non-negative. Then you get that this is increasing. p doesn't necessarily have to be the second order expansion or anything like that. Right? Um, Plus, how does the proof for n for n is enough where the first is second order approximation? Mm. No, yeah, so, so this, this basically relates, give me any quadratic p, I mean, can be very far from u, and this would be always far from p, right? I mean, you, but, but usually you think that this p is the approximation of u at a certain scale, and then it tells you that when you go to lower scale, the quadratic approximation of u cannot vary too much from whatever it was at scale one. But yeah, but yeah, but this p is not necessarily is not related to u. It's just fixed uh, any quadratic polynomial w w with these properties. So Colombo, Spolaor, and Velichkov they uh, use again Weiss monotonicity formula with an improved epiperimetric inequality to show actually that this sigma k so resulting in uh, any dimension at the sigma k are including in C1 log, let's say log to some power delta with tiny delta manifolds in any dimension, yeah, in, in for any n. 
so uh, already doesn't look so good in higher dimensions so in two dimension here it says that the, the singular set uh, this has to be included in c1 alpha curve when you go to higher dimension you get c1 log well, this is their result. Is this optimal or not? Well, may maybe we're going to try to understand. Delta. delta is something that depends on the dimension. So it's some very, very weak models of continuity. You say C1, but it's not C1 alpha. So you can measure. So it's a little bit an improvement. It's a quantified C1 models of continuity. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain maybe a little, bit, a little bit better what it means C1 log. And then finally, let me write here in uh, the, the, the best result. So this last year, the best result is in 2018 by Figali, Figali and Serra, in which said that, well, actually the, the top stratum, if you look at sigma n minus one with the, higher, with the highest vanishing order, this is a C1 alpha is included in C1 alpha manifold, while the other ones, the other stratum, they are included in a C1 log, some delta manifold. Yeah, so this would include both the result in 2D, which says this, and this one here. Yeah. And Figali and Sarah, they so their proof, again, use, I mean, uh, is based on monotonicity formulas. They use Almgren, so I'm going to write here Almgren. Almgren frequency, frequency formula, monotonicity formula plus monomonotonicity formula plus vice monotonicity formula. So, so they use a lot of, mono, I mean, they use uh, basically everything that, that, uh, that was known before to, to, to prove the result. And what I want to say today is basically a slightly different approach to, to study regularity of the singular set. So this is I'm gonna write here a result from, from this year. in which we can, uh, so, so this is a result with my postdoc, who you. So we proved essentially the same, that sigma k, sigma n minus one is included in the C1 alpha manifold. Yeah. <coughs> and sigma k in the C1 log, delta bat, without using monotonicity formulas, so, and our proof would apply also to nonlinear uh, obstacle problems. So for the nonlinear obstacle problem, which you can say that you have some uh, operator F it is fully nonlinear uh, on the matrix U, and this you want this to be the characteristic function where U is positive. And with capital F being convex and C1 in uniform degree. But uh, so basically we can we can reproduce whatever is known for the Laplace in the case of fully nonlinear operators, but it's not so important this rather than basically we just try to redo the same for the Laplace, but without monotonicity formulas, right? So without having a quantity that would give you information directly from scale one to all other scale, but rather try to do an improvement of flatness regularity to, to go from scale one to one half to one quarter to one quarter and so on. Yeah. So for the remaining time, I'll try to explain a bit and, and somehow it, it made, uh, made us understand a bit better the previous results. Yeah. I mean, wh why there is this distinction between the higher stratum and the lower stratum. And uh, so, so let me just try to explain a bit what is, uh, I mean, yeah, what, what, what's happening. 
So the f especially if these results they like at the end do you have like any bounds for alpha? Like in any of these results, like yours and the previous ones? Uh, okay, so so we'll see. So the alpha is very closely so you mean you mean he you mean here or here? Yeah, so I think yeah, fr from from the proofs you get an idea what uh, well you, you're gonna we're gonna reduce it to a different problem <laughs> to to get the optimal alpha. But yeah, from the proofs it'd be clear. Is, is alpha and the I remember the other alphas as like is this alpha better than other alpha or they're the same alpha? I, I think they are the same. Yeah, I mean yeah, I, I I believe yeah, it's not that would give n n results. better results, but. Uh, um, Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe it explains better, at least to me, what's happening, right? Um, so basically, what we have here, we already know the blow up, uh, the, the blow up limits, uh, right? So, so essentially, what you'd like to do, you say, I already know that my function is very close to a quadratic polynomial. Why can't I just try to do the regular? like shout their estimates and try to approximate you better and better by quadratic at its most. It won't be for infinity to formal, but you don't know about the system to blow up with that infinity to formal. Yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can prove, yes. So, so you can you prove. Can such propositions without, without no infinity to formal. I, I mean, ex you, can, you can show that the blow up sequence is uh, one of those two things without monotonicity formula. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's not too difficult. You, you can just look at the maximal second derivative in some sense. And because your second derivatives are already bounded, it tells you that where you have a maximum, if you achieve the maximum, that uh, this has to be constant everywhere. So somehow you can reduce it without monotonicity formula. Yeah, you can, you can just say that the limits have to be quadratic, essentially. Yeah. You, you do a maximum principle on second derivatives. But 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 this this don't come from higher order derivatives, right? This is just the vanishing order of the poly of the polynomial. So basically, it is just saying that if I'm in 3D, I can have uh, singular points. I can have lines of singularity of planes of singularity. So so K stands for the dimension of the vanishing. Uh, the singular has set can have different dimensions depending on the the, the limit, the blow up limit. Yes. Yeah, so, so it has nothing to do with, uh, with higher, uh, higher order uh, uh, derivatives. Yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, so as I said, the, the approach, the naive approach would be to say, well, u is very close to a quadratic polynomial p at, as in, in b1. So I'm going to say this is less than or equal to epsilon in b1. So I would really like to say that when I go to a smaller ball, then I can approximate u maybe with a slightly different quadratic polynomial, let's say less than one half epsilon rho squared in b rho. So I'm doing, let's say, I I'm using L infinity norm. So I'm saying u is epsilon close to a quadratic polynomial in b1. Can I show that u is epsilon over two quadratic close to uh, a slightly rotated polynomial. If I do, if I have this statement, then I can prove, then I'm gonna be able to prove this right away because it's gonna tell me that U is C2 alpha at all the points and, and I'm, I'm going to be done, yeah? So this would be the statement that one would, would be trying to prove, yeah? Uh, so let's say try, so let's say. Try to prove this. The, how, however, this is a bit uh, more delicate because we are doing we are looking at singular points. So, uh, if if I look, for example, at a if I think that this polynomial p I'm in two D and is just vanishing on a line, let's say, I think that this is p. And then I'm trying to perturb it a little bit. U is not exactly this, but it's a small perturbation from it, right? What I'm trying to say is that when I go to half the ball, 
I can still approximate it by a quadratic polynomial. Well, th this is not really, this is clearly not the case. You can try to take this quadratic polynomial and lower it just a little bit down. Yeah? So if I, if I just lower it a bit down, then the picture that I'm going to see would be a quadratic, but then I would have a little flat piece where you'd coincide with zero. Sort of the origin can be here. I say, well, it looks like a quadratic here, but then when I'm going to zoom in, the origin, <laughs> when I get closer and closer and closer to the origin, then my approximation will be more like a half plane. Yeah? So this is, so the difficulty is that singular points, let me write it like this, so singular points are unstable under small perturbations. So somehow, for sure, whatever I wrote on top is not true, but I have to write here that zero is a singular point. So somehow I have to distinguish, in, in some sense, what I have to distinguish when I'm in this, this situation. If I don't put that zero as a singular point, I have to distinguish that sometimes I might end up with a regular point, and some other times I'm still at a singular point, and I can approximate better than that. Yeah? So. So this for sure is part of the assumption. Okay. So now in the remaining time, I don't know, I don't have much time, but let me just go fast and maybe over uh, what, what's happening. So, yes. But so with the strategy, it seems harder to get the logarithm though, right? I mean, because if you, if you get an improvement by half. Oh, th this would give you, yes. Yeah, so, so you cannot do this you all the time. Always, you get, you, yes. You Yes, okay. yes, yeah, 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 yes. So if you get like one minus two out of like number six, then I mean, he, here you just, well, if you can improve this by a little bit. Yeah. you I mean, basically here I'm saying that when I go from scale one to scale rho, the epsilon <coughs> improves from epsilon to epsilon over two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show that, well, if I, if I have time that this does not happen. Uh, you can improve only very little sometimes, not, not, not not by a factor, then by, but by... But then it's not a scaling invariant statement. Right? So that's, that is, I mean, if you're putting, like, when you're suggesting one minus rho, it's not a scaling invariant statement. It sort of w stirs me a little bit. W which one is not the... Uh, I mean, he was, he was suggesting that maybe, you know, instead of having one half, you have, like, one minus rho. But, but no, no, no. One minus rho is still So, so what, what you're going to be able to put here would be epsilon minus, let's say, epsilon cubed. So saying that ah. your epsilon to, when you go to half the ball, is just improving by epsilon to a power. So okay. for it to become half, okay. you have to wait a very, very long time. Okay. And uh, so, okay. so, so, okay. so, so it's scaling invariant, so I'm happy with that. So, so yeah, so, so this is sort of what happens okay. with, with, with a higher strata. But, okay, so, so let me just go brief because that time is almost up so let me go briefly over, over the three cases so let's let's say first that we are in two dimension right if we are in two dimension you can try to think that the polynomial p is really so let's say i, I, I i'll do two cases so polynomial p is exactly one fourth x squared into d which means that your polynomial p is exactly the the round parabola the the, the a nice parabola and you can try to think that your solution u is an epsilon perturbation from it then what happens in this case so in this case you can show that u is convex actually so you can show that u is convex a full convex function the reason for that is sort of the second derivatives if i look at the pure second derivative if I stay far away, so at the origin, I don't know very well what happens. I might have some coincidence set or not. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's fat, if it's thin, but if I stay far away from the origin, if I stay a distance one half away from the origin, my function is going to look very close to this. <coughs> it's harmonic. So the second derivatives are positive, far away from the origin. 
and the good thing about the, the, the obstacle problem is you might you can only say that the second drift is as you move outward your domain they are positive because your function is zero but then has to be non-negative so somehow this holds on the on the free boundary this holds far away from the free boundary right let's say on the boundary of the one half so by maximum principle second derivatives are harmonic you can say that this happens everywhere so u e, e is greater than or equal to zero everywhere which means that u is convex why does this help you because it, it helps you because it tells you that this coincidence set it's either a convex set but in that case, all the free boundary points are regular points, or it has, I mean, it might be a segment or something like this, but it has zero interior, which means that actually your function u is fully harmonic. It's like Laplace of u would be equal to one everywhere, from in which case you're basically not, not solving any obstacle problem. So, so here, by proving that u is convex essentially, you distinguish between the points that are regular whenever you're going to get a convex patch or singular okay so this is the easy case how about when you have a full line of singularity so i'll, I'll try to go fast yeah so when you have a full line of singularity like this Again, you, I, I'm thinking I'm, I, I perturb the function, so I say that u minus, so let's say p in this case is one half x two squared. Let's say x, this is the x one variable, and that one, the, and, and the perpendicular to it is the x two variable. So I have u minus p is less than or equal than epsilon. Of course. The, you, you want to check this error relative to epsilon you'd like to improve that so really the, the function that we are really interested in is the error which would be u minus p over epsilon yeah what you know by hypothesis is that your error is always between minus one and one but this solves the laplace of this and the laplace of this are the same where u is positive so what what it tells you tells you is that laplace of u tilde is zero away from the obstacle away from which obstacle would be minus one over epsilon p minus one over epsilon. this is the obstacle for u tilde because u u is not negative sort of this is always bigger than this minus one over epsilon p so essentially the error solves an obstacle problem in which the obstacle is this right? so what is this this is a very sort of index one variable is still zero, but index variable is very steep. So basically the, the new obstacle looks like this. Right. So you think you have some boundary data or function. So this is your U tilde, which says that is harmonic. it's harmonic away from an obstacle but this obstacle becomes very steep index to variable and index one variable is still zero that's what happens here yes yeah? so, so so the steepness of this parabola is minus one over epsilon x to square this is so as epsilon tends to zero what you really end up here you end up with a thin obstacle problem I mean, you get an obstacle that is becoming very thin index to variable this is the thin obstacle problem and somehow it says that this at least in this case the problem is closely related to the obstacle problem the, the obstacle problem is the linearization of what's happening here and well I, I don't have much time because it's over but but essentially you can use the okay l l let me just say one thing so in the obstacle problem in the thin obstacle problem you get an expansion near a free boundary point and this expansion is the first order is out of the three half cosine of three theta over two which is the real part of z to the three half you want to prove that u tilde improves quadratically this first part does not improve quadratically because it's a power less than two so somehow this is inconsistent with what i'm trying to prove 
but I'll show that if this coefficient here, this has a coefficient in front in, in an expansion. If this coefficient is non-zero, then actually my point has to be a regular point. So actually what happens is that every time the solution of the thin obstacle problem that I get in the limit has a non-zero coefficient, actually the free boundary has to look not really cusp-like, but it'll have to bend very much like epsilon away and here just bend smoothly around if, if this is a first order. Mm. So this shouldn't be here because I'm at a singular point and then I'm going to ha have a second quadratic term. I'm going to have here some sort of quadratic term which would be a x two squared minus, sorry, a x one squared minus x two squared plus b x one x two plus of x cubed. And if I have this, then I'm happy because bis this basically tells me that I can improve quadratically and so on. Now, the only difference when you go in 3D is that your obstacle here, if I, if I can be super thin obstacle, right? So super thin obstacle, imagine that I'm in 3D and uh, the obstacle is thin, but in the X2, X3 variable. So that's a set of zero capacity. So actually, when you go to 3D, you're solving an obstacle problem, but with obstacle that as epsilon tends to zero becomes the zero capacity. So somehow your approximation, U tilde, would be a harmonic function. So I'll just draw the last picture and then we'll be done. So if I go in 3D, so in 2D, I can do C1 alpha. I mean, so far I didn't see any, any problem with where, where the log appears. But when you go to 3D, So I'll, I'll try to draw a picture like in 2D, but let's think that it's radially symmetric. Yeah, so something like this. So, so the last picture would be that if I'm in 3D, I would see some sort of U tilde is a function sort of uh, that, that tries to be harmonic, but has to stay above a super thin obstacle. So what would happen with U tilde would go up here sort of would climb up here, would go down, sorry, <laughs> something like this. Yeah. So when I go to 3D, I, I'm no longer in the setting of a thin obstacle problem, I'm in the setting of a super thin obstacle problem in which U tilde wants to be harmonic, but at some point has to jump over a very thin obstacle and then be harmonic again. So if I try to improve quadratically, sort of the harmonic part improves quadratically, but the obstacle also, I mean, there is a, an adjustment between the obstacle and the quadratic part of the harmonic function th when they don't match. Yeah, so, so, so uh, well, I'll, I'll try to, to show basically what's, what's happening. So in reality, okay. Uh, Okay, let, let, let me try to draw one last picture, which would be, this would be the obstacle. So somehow I can approximate U tilde by a harmonic function. So U tilde is almost harmonic, except that it has to climb on some obstacle. So if I look very close to the origin and I look at the quadratic expansion of the harmonic polynomial, I'll see something that would look like this in the worst case scenario. So, so I can try to think that my function, my U tilde that I'm trying to improve quadratically looks very much like a quadratic polynomial, but at some point does this and climbs over an obstacle and then continues of being quadratic. Yeah. So there is no way of improving this quadratically. If I zoom in, the difference between the straight line and the, and the curved one is still quadratic. So sort of this is, is improving like at a very, very slow rate. And it has to do with the capacity of this piece that pops out 
relative to the whole ball. So the smaller this piece is, the less and less I'm improving. That's why in the quadratic improvement of flatness, instead of saying that I improve from epsilon to epsilon over 2, actually I'm going to improve from epsilon to epsilon minus epsilon to some power. Depending on the capacitor, you can say precisely what this power is when you look at the picture and so on. So from here, sort of this is the difference between 3D and 2D. Yeah? So in 3D, uh, you're solving some sort of super thin obstacle problem that you have to quantify in terms of the thickness of the obstacle, how far your second derivatives improve. Yeah. Okay, so I'll stop here. I apologize, I went over time. Yeah.